When I go for a run, it takes a lot to distract me. But blundering into an exceptionally strong and sticky web, and then looking down to see something like this, does tend to do the trick. And in the instances where this happens to someone who may not be quite as nonchalant about having a large spider on their body as myself, the results can be traumatising for the victim, incredibly amusing for any onlookers, and sadly often fatal for the spider. The culprits in these incidents of accidental face-hugging are more often than not golden orb weavers. Very large orb weaving spiders that spin huge golden webs. And these impressive creatures are what this episode of the Guide to Australian Spiders will be all about. Golden orb weavers, like the tent spiders that were covered in the previous episode, belong to the family Araniidae. However, they are classified within a different subfamily, called the Nephilinae, and while the golden orb weavers may be easily the most well-known and recognisable members of this group, there are a few other comparatively obscure but no less fascinating spiders that also belong to the subfamily, and they will get their limelight in a future episode. Now let's talk about the subfamily as a whole. The subfamily Nephilinae was first erected to accommodate the eponymous genus Nephila and some close relatives. In 2006, the group was elevated to family level. However, phylogenetic analyses consistently suggested it was nested within the Uraniidae family, leading to its return to subfamily level following a 2016 revision. Guess we took the scenic route but ended up at the same place. This group of spiders exhibits some of the most incredible sexual dimorphism in the animal kingdom. As is the case for most spiders, males are smaller than females. However, the Nephilinae take this disparity to a completely different level. In fact, these spiders display the most extreme examples of sexual size dimorphism out of any terrestrial animals. For the males, there are some benefits to being a midget, such as the ability to move about on a female's web without drawing her attention. Clearly very handy when your would-be valentine could snapple you up in an instant. Likewise, females may benefit from a larger size due to increased fecundity, which is the ability to produce a greater number of offspring. Although the large sizes of females may bestow upon them a somewhat imposing appearance, all members of this subfamily are essentially harmless to humans, being both mildly venomous and reluctant to bite. If disturbed, they will generally flee to the top of their web. The Nephilinae spin spectacular webs, among the largest constructed by any spiders. While some other orb weavers spin temporary webs that are removed and reconstructed on a nightly basis, the webs of Nephilinae are permanent and less majorly damaged. Bit lazy I guess, but I can't blame them. Those things look tedious to make and I for one would very quickly burn out if I had to pull something like that out of my behind on a nightly basis, and not in the figurative sense. When on their webs, these spiders are fast moving, agile and almost unassailable. But on the ground, they're as useless as a shoe shop in the Shire. This subfamily contains seven extant genera, Clitetra, Herenia, Inditra, Nephila, Nephilangius, Nephilingius, and Trichonephila. Of those, Herenia, Nephila, Nephilangius, and Trichonephila occur in Australia, with only Nephila and Trichonephila being especially common. Let's kick this video off by taking a look at the genus Nephila. Australia is home to just a single Nephila species, but it's certainly an impressive one. Nephila pilipes, the type species of the genus, is Australia's largest orb-weaving spider, and one of the biggest in the world. Females attain a body length of up to 50 millimetres, and their leg span can reach 200 millimetres, one of the widest leg spans of any Australian spider. Immense as these spiders are, viral images such as this, needless to say, do employ forced perspective to a rather considerable extent. Nephilopilipes is widespread throughout Southeast Asia, but here in Australia its occurrence is a bit more localised. 
It is abundant toward the continent's tropical north, though its distribution does range south along the coast of Queensland into New South Wales. However, it does not appear to be quite as common there, being mostly restricted to rainforest. Two smaller golden orb weavers, which will be covered later in the video, tend to be far more abundant further south. These spiders spin enormous aerial orb webs with a distinctive golden sheen, hence the name golden orb weaver. In addition to this, the hub of the web is situated closer to the top, in contrast to the webs of most orb weavers in which the hub is centrally positioned. Their silk is among the strongest produced by any spider, and as a result these formidable creatures may ensnare and prey upon animals that most other invertebrates could only dream of capturing. Everything from birds to bats to snakes. Scolopendra gigantea, of course, is profoundly unimpressed by these spiders' capabilities. Poor guy doesn't get anywhere near as much attention for the same thing, and without needing a big fancy web either. The spider itself is also readily distinguishable from any of its close relatives, at least in Australia. Adult females in particular are very recognisable. They are, as aforementioned, huge significantly outsizing any other Australian orb weavers. Their pedipalps are vivid red and the legs are black, although a red-legged variant does exist, extremely long and lack any distinct tufts of hair. Some of the leg joints are marked with vibrant yellow bands that are especially visible from the spider's underside. The opisthosoma is elongated and generally rather plainly coloured, typically ranging from grey to brown, although various markings may be present, especially on the underside. Males are orange in colour, and as stated before, are minute in comparison to the females. It is also worth noting that the appearance of the species, particularly the patterning on the opisthosoma, varies across its rather broad geographical range. And the description given above, while largely applicable to Australian populations, may not be quite as fitting for those from some Asian localities, which can exhibit significantly more extensive and intricate patterning. Toward the end of their short lives, females of these magnificent spiders will descend to the forest floor to bury their eggs in the substrate. While some may retain enough energy to return to their lofty perches and possibly lay another clutch further down the line, for most, this will be their final act. This behaviour is very distinctive among orb weavers, including other Nephila species, which tend to affix their egg sacs to vegetation and other anchor points close to the spider's web. Now let's move on to the closely related genus Trichonephila. Members of this genus were once grouped within Nephila, but there was an issue with this classification. As shown by this phylogeny, Nephila was originally diphyletic, meaning its members were derived from two separate ancestral lines. When classifying organisms, it is preferable to ensure all groupings are monophyletic, in other words, with only a single origin. In a monophyletic group, also known as a clade, all members are more closely related to one another than they are to any taxon outside the group. For the genus Nephila, this was not the case. As can be seen, one of the two Nephila subgroups was more closely related to genus Clitetra than to the other Nephila subgroup. And among other changes to the phylogeny of the subfamily Nephilinae, one of the groups was moved to genus Trichonephila. So now, instead of one diphyletic genus, we have two monophyletic genera. Trichonephila are, in many respects, very similar to Nephila species. Like them, the females of many species are very large and vividly coloured. In fact, this genus contains what is possibly the biggest orb-weaving spider known, Trichonephila comacai, a relatively recently discovered species found in South Africa and Madagascar. Their webs also parallel those of Nephila, possessing both the same structure and the same golden sheen. Australia is home to two, or perhaps three, Trichonephila species, two of which are very commonly encountered. The possible third, Trichonephila antipodiana, 
is said to occur in Queensland, although since I have yet to find any records accompanied by photographs, I presume that Trichonephala antipodiana are not a frequent sight in Australia, if present here at all. So let's talk about the other two. First up is Trichonephala plumipes, sometimes called the tiger spider, coastal golden orb weaver or banded orb weaver. This species is most abundant along Australia's eastern coast, especially from southeast Queensland down to the southern border of New South Wales. However, it does range elsewhere, including North Queensland and the Northern Territory, as well as other localities such as New Caledonia and Vanuatu. Although dwarfed by Nephilopilipes, Trichonephila plumipes is still an impressively sized spider, with females reaching body lengths of approximately 35mm and leg spans a little in excess of 100mm. Their legs are adorned with tufts of black hairs, the feature that the species name plumipes, meaning plumed leg, refers to. Like Nephilopilipes, these spiders also possess yellow bands on some of the leg joints, although unlike those of the former, which tend to be only clearly visible from beneath, the bands on Trichonephila plumipes legs can be easily discerned from any angle. Another diagnostic feature of the species is a distinctive bump situated on the sternum. The opisthosoma ranges from grey to beige in coloration, and lacks any obvious patterning. It is also noticeably more rounded in comparison to the rather elongated forms exhibited by Nephilopilipes and many overseas species. Males are, of course, far smaller. It is not uncommon for several males to occupy the periphery of an adult female's web, waiting for their chance to have a bit of adult playtime. It should also be said too that the descriptions of coloration, although applicable to Australian populations, are not necessarily in line with the appearance of some overseas varieties, which may look markedly different. Similarly to Nephila, these spiders spin very large aerial orb webs, often with an admittedly rather unsightly string of partially consumed prey items situated close to the centre, which provides the resident spider with a secondary source of nourishment in the absence of fresh captures. It is also quite common to find them in large aggregations, with neighbouring webs often interconnecting, although each individual spider remains within its own. Unlike some properly social spiders, they do not cooperate in prey capture or really interact to any substantial degree at all, so it's basically just a very awkward social gathering. Needless to say, these colonies consisting of layer upon layer of tough sticky silk present a major obstacle to both flying animals and unsuspecting humans out for a midnight piss. These aggregations may consist only of conspecifics, in other words members of the same species, but it's far from rare for other spiders to join the party too. Species like Chitophora malacensis, covered in the guide's previous episode, flexing on the other orb weavers with its fancy domed web. Now let's move on to the closely related and very similar Trichonephila edulis. While Trichonephila plumipes is mostly restricted to Australia's eastern coast, Trichonephila edulis occurs throughout the continent with the exception of Tasmania. It has also been recorded in localities such as New Caledonia and New Zealand. In the coastal regions where the two species overlap in range, Trichonephila plumipes is generally more common, although Trichonephila edulis is far from rare, and it's fairly commonplace to find them coexisting in close proximity. In the continent's more arid inland regions, this species is the only golden orb weaver present and is therefore difficult to mistake for anything else. Trichonephila edulis is similar in size and overall build to Trichonephila plumipes. However, its coloration and patterning is markedly different. The overall appearance of the animal is comparatively more subdued, predominantly consisting of various shades of grey, brown and off-white, and lacking the distinctive yellow bands of Trichonephila plumipes. The legs possess tufts of black hairs, which are most prominent on the first and second leg pairs. These plumes are, rather ironically, noticeably larger than those of Trichonephila plumipes, 
which, as aforementioned, was literally named based on its leg plumes. Guess the spider fashion industry is as fraught with cheap poses as the human one. Poor Trichonephila edulis sadly does not get to be named after its fashionable leg adornments, and was instead unflatteringly given a name that means edible, in reference to the fact that New Caledonians were observed consuming these spiders. That concludes this episode of the Guide to Australian Spiders. If you want to watch this series from the beginning, and it's still in its very early stages, then check out the guide's playlist here, and if you enjoy my content then don't forget to subscribe. Thank you very much for watching, that is it from me, and I shall see you again very soon.